Welcome, everyone. This is the Dr. Finance Live podcast. Dr. Anthony Crenitti here, also known as Dr. Finance. We have a great guest today, Jay Cruz. Jay uh, is actually my narrator for two of my books out of three. He's, he's working on the third one. He's also a radio producer of about 35 years, seasoned veteran. His uh, normal um, audience is about 1,000 people per hour. So let's give it up to Jay. We're going to learn a lot about the radio business and how it relates to money today. Welcome, Jay. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Anthony. Tony, Dr. Finance. <laughs> I like all your names. Thanks. Proud to be on the Finance me. Live podcast here. <laughs> so how's it going, Jay? How are you today? I'm good. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, currently in the process of, of uh, working on, on book number three and in the series of books that you have on, um, on finances here. So I'm on the, uh, in the third book, The Survival. And that's, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting stuff. And I can't wait to get this done and get it out there. I want people to hear it. Oh, that's great, Jay. So we're, we're going to learn a little bit about your industry, uh, le learn a little about yourself, of course, and, um, and money too. So we're here to talk about finance, talk about money. And, um, but first let's get started. Let, let's learn about yourself. Jay, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? And then, uh, we'll talk about how you, uh, originated into this business. Sure. Um, basically broadcasting is now kind of a hybrid of broadcasting podcasting. I did begin in, in traditional radio, you know, through college radio and some stuff during high school, did morning announcements, PA announcements at, at my high school's football and basketball game. Apparently, I was a lucky charm. The team was undefeated in basketball when I announced the home game. So that was kind of a nice thing. And that kind of gave me a, a step into it. By that time, I started researching where to go to uh, college locally in the Bay Area, got involved with college radio, and then some internships with some of the commercial rock stations and uh, ended up in in, in music radio, rock and roll radio, which was, which was a lot of fun and perfect for me. Although, you know, looking back at a sports station, given me the offer for an internship, you know, I might've stepped into sports just as easily. I enjoyed both, you know, quite a bit and uh, got to do some internships, eventually got on air working professionally, worked, you know, doing commercials, uh, street team stuff with promotions, getting out, meeting listeners. And then you know, starting to pay the dues, doing the overnight shows, weekends, fill-ins. Uh, I got my first on-air gig in Monterey and then moved up to the San Jose market where I, you know, pretty much worked through the 90s at a couple of the big rock stations there and uh, got to learn a lot about it, you know, just by being around some great people, you know, seeing a couple format changes, seeing other stations come and go. And, you know, it was also nice that I grew up a fan of those radio stations and got to work for them too. So, that ended in the 90s. I wasn't in radio for a little bit of time. And I moved to Southern California where I was where I was born, but essentially grew up in, in Northern California and came down here kind of to be near the beach. Change of life. That's when it was with uh, radio and stuff. I mean, obviously we were sending emails and things like that, but the the uh, media and stuff, you know, getting radio, podcasting. Uh, streaming services were just starting. So I sort of stepped in and in, in the thousands and have been going with internet radio since. And there's a lot of similarities, but there's some differences too between broadcasting and podcasting, if you will. Okay, great. So, so Jay, you were originally from Northern California and then you came down to S Southern California. What, what was your first radio gig that you had? Um, well, my first radio gig um, I did a little bit of babysitting automation, actually, where uh, this AM station that I interned for, they were an AM FM station, and the AM station hired me to do a Saturday night shift where I basically would either do in-studio board op for the local, it was uh, San Jose State basketball uh, they were carrying, and on nights that there wasn't a basketball game, I would essentially babysit the automation, make sure it stayed on time, make sure all the voice tracks worked and stuff. Back then, it was all recorded on a reel-to-reel, -reel, and the computer that ran the automation was something like out of a James Bond 60s sci-fi movie where the computer was literally the size of the wall. You know, it had these big circular 
discs that moved everything. And, you know, and we sit there and realize what well, we have, you know, with iPods and, uh, you know, phones and, and phone, you know, these smartphones in our hands, you know, that can do so many things. It's just amazing that really in like 30, 35, 40 years, the technology has really, you know, gone to that extreme, you know, from a computer the size of a wall to something, <laughs> you know, exponentially more powerful and smarter that we carry on our phone, or in, our, in our pockets on a phone. What, what decade was that? Was that the 80s? Uh, yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was, that was the 80s. And, uh, you know, from there, I remember I ended up, <laughs> you know, um, and I kept, you know, sliding tapes to the, to the program director at, at that station. And, you know, they, I mean, at that time I was like 19, you know, so they're like, you know, you're good, but, you know, maybe like you'd have a little more experience or go get some experience. And one of the people that they hired had actually worked at a Monterey station, which is about an hour and a half away from San Jose, you know, close enough where I could go start a weekend. And I, I started sending them tapes and then they eventually hired me. So that was my first on-air paid job. And that was a rock station in Monterey, which is a great place to live. You know, mm -hmm. there's a few things that uh, happened there each and every year that were really cool events, mainly the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, which takes place shortly after the Super Bowl, was always a big draw. And then there was a race racetrack out there that they would have some uh, motorcycle and Grand Prix races that were kind of interesting but you know it's a it's a great town to, to kind of get started the only problem for me though it was an expensive town and since it was a smaller market you know i needed to go to a at that time a bigger market where i could make a little more money and you know wanted to advance my career and not have to put all my money into gas and rent just to <laughs> work at a job that i enjoyed you know i wanted to have a little something extra so um you know it was a great place to start and learn a lot. And then I, you know, wanted to get back into San Jose where I knew those stations are bigger, paid better, and ultimately were going to be more successful if I could get there. And eventually I did get back to San Jose at a state, couple stations there. Uh, that's great, Jay. So the, the current um, radio station you work at now, that, that's the one you've been at the longest. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Um, I've been here since late 2000, and we started in late 2002. It was October of 2002 when um, HealthyLife.net began began streaming, and a couple of years after that, we went to 24/7. But I've been here since 2002. It was kind of interesting that I was I came down to Southern California really without a without a really a without looking to get back into radio or broadcasting, because at that time, the late nineties, I had now done a number of years of it since, you know, college in the eighties, working through the nineties, you know, now I'm like 15 years into it. And uh, the stations I was working at, they were bought, sold, and I was, you know, laid off, let go, uh, furloughed, any of those fun words you want to do, but basically <laughs> I was no longer employed by the station and no longer in radio had to get a regular job for a bit. I worked in retail for about a year and a half and really didn't like it. I ended up catching a case of pneumonia in the Christmas of December of 2000. And I swore I would not be there for 2001 to catch pneumonia again, being overworked and started making plans to, to change my life and, and do something to make myself happy. Figure at that point I was in my thirties and it was a good time to reassess the next phase of my life figured okay radio was fun had a great time got to meet a lot of cool rock stars got to get paid for what i do didn't get paid as much as i wanted to because you know it's one of those jobs where you know they can almost hire anybody to come in and go well you get all these perks you know so we're going to pay you really low wages because you get all these free tickets you get to meet all these uh cool stars you get free concert tickets and all the CDs you can eat was always kind of the joke, you know, <laughs> but I've been here at healthylife.net uh, since 2002 and it's a little different, you know, it's mainly a all talk station and, you know, also we're positioned as the all positive talk station where we don't, don't get into a lot of the controversy and stuff where, you know, a lot of traditional talk radio will, you know, they'll take subjects a that they know that 50% of the room is going to feel one way and 50% of the other might feel the other way and they just you know sit there and get all these great phone calls from listeners who are fired up and passionate about whatever it is they're talking about who want to throw in their opinion or maybe want to counteract what the last guy said 
And uh, anyway, we don't do that here. We allow our, our guests and hosts to kind of go into detail with what they do and, you know, try to explain things, you know, with a solution instead of just stick, you know, trying to kick up more controversy because we can find that any day of the week, almost anywhere we look. So it's been rewarding thinking that the people that listen to our station get something out of it and it benefits their life or it can benefit somebody they know, you know, and get some good out of it. So it's kind of rewarding to be able to give back and, um, you know, not just playing records, although nothing was wrong with that. This way is, you know, a little more involved and a little more, uh, a little bit more passionate and in, in helping people tell their stories and getting into that, you know, even all those years in the rock radio years, well, it was a lot of fun. You know, at some point, probably the epiphany hit me in the middle of the night going, you know, these listeners don't necessarily care about me so much, but they love the records that we're playing. You know, I didn't write any of these Led Zeppelin songs or any of these classic songs that we're hearing. So I'm just the guy who gets to play them, you know. So uh, being involved in talk radio, you, you have to create more. You have to create the story. You have to write it. You have to, you know, create your own content instead of just pushing a button and going, Thank you, Rolling Stones. If it wasn't for that song, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have all these years of, of, of followers on our station. So, so, so Jay, um, what role has money played in your uh, career? Like um, starting from the beginning, has it, has it helped or hurt you? I mean, were, were you able to, well, let's go with that first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, that's a, that's a great point. You know, this is, you know, there are a lot of people who can make a, a very good living in, in broadcasting, radio, voiceovers and stuff. And a lot of people that, you know, maybe, you know, struggle or, or what have you. I think, I don't know if I would blame it on the industry myself. I think at the time when I first got into it, uh, you know, looking back, I would have definitely advised myself to have had a, a second job along the side or have done something else. So that radio wasn't my only, I didn't have to depend on that for my my only source of income, you know, it would have been better to have had something on the side. But at the same time, I was also the first guy, the first guy that they would call for a uh, fill in because I didn't have a second job, you know. So there was a lot of things that went good with it, things that went bad with it. You know, it didn't pay so well. But at the same time, when I was younger, I think I was more focused on the the fun aspects of radio and not concerned so much about the financial aspects. And then a little bit later as it did start going on and as in my twenties, you know, that's traditionally when people start thinking of um, relationships, marriage, starting a family. And there was a point where I was, you know, dating someone and, you know, she put out the let's have kids conversation. And I, <laughs> I, as much as I liked her and, you know, I was probably getting to that point to start thinking about, that for sure biologically for both of us you know i was like i don't know if i can really financially support like another child or a family at this point so uh you know it was a struggle a lot of times and i wish i would have known more about finance all around back then um because even which part would you uh which part would you have liked to know best out of all the things in finance i mean you've read two of my books so far out of all those, Probably, what could help you the most? Um, just a good way to have more of a discipline on on budget, on savings, and thinking long term. Definitely, it's it's tough to to think long term sometimes when you're young. You you want the shiny object and. You know, I was in a, I was in an industry that was, that was fun. And that's probably part of what attracted me to it. You know, it was a lot of, a lot of go, go, go concerts. Um, tomorrow's show is going to be better than yesterday's show. And, and it kind of really kept going. And as it, it kept going, you know, more and more things would happen. And then just, you know, you think, well, someday I'll get a raise. And then, uh, you know, at some point you're just kind of capped at that certain level. And, you know, I wish I would have known more how to, how to save and invest, maybe find some other ways to make money, you know, that are out there, which, uh, you know, that involves, you know, investing, passive income, uh, again, planning for the long term, you know, planning for things, you know, taxes isn't long term, but we got to deal with that every year. And that's long term enough, you know, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to this weekend's this weekend's fun or this weekend's event, as opposed to taxes each and every year. So, you know, that was uh, 
definitely wish I would have known more about that. It's definitely planning more on long term and some maybe ways to find money work for me, you know. Mm-hmm. And I probably had known some of that. I probably would have been more my ears and eyes would have been a little more open to finding the connections that maybe would have came around where I may have met somebody along those years who may have said, Hey, you know, maybe this was an opportunity for you in addition to what you're already doing. So, um, and I knew some people that also, you know, had moved into the area and had come in with another full-time job and looked at radio as their part-time job. I never looked at radio as a part-time thing. It was for me, it was all in, I was going to do broadcasting radio career and try to learn all aspects about it so you know maybe looking back i think having a a secondary plan would have been good and and then you know again some long-term investment stuff like that would have been nice nice to have known too i think back then i thought an investment was more like betting on a football game (laughs) and that's that has a lot of excitement but i wouldn't suggest that for many people (laughs) oh yeah you know it, this, is, uh, this is actually a common theme. Do, do, would you think that a lot of people in your industry uh, had the same uh, outlook or the same, same issues that you encountered? Yeah, I definitely think so. There was Especially a number of people. And, you know, actresses and all the, all the artistic type uh, people out there. Absolutely. I think I heard a statistic from an actor that said something like 90% of the actors technically aren't working. They, you know, they're auditioning all the time. And, you know, there's a big kind of stereotype joke, you know, when you, when I first moved to LA, it was tough to find a job. And I was like, you know, do they just not want to hire me? Cause they think I'm going to work here until I find, you know, my, my big thing, whatever it is I'm really here for my dream, if you will, you know, to chase movies or, you know, get into the record business or, or radio or whatever it is. So, and I think there's a, you know, a lot of people that, you know, when they get here to Hollywood, they, uh, you know, find it tough and have to have a second job and maybe don't make it or don't know these things, you know, when they get there, they think they're just going to show up and, and uh, everything is going to go right for them. But, you know, that's, if you move anywhere, those things are going to be tough. You need connections, you need inroads into it, you know, entertainment, creative stuff seems to be, uh, I don't, just cause I've dealt with it a little bit you know through my whole life you know it seems i don't know if tougher but it seems that there's more people that would rather make money doing something creative because they think it's fun as opposed to uh you know people signing up for maybe good paying jobs that provide stability but just aren't exciting and sexy you know i mean i know a guy who's made a great living providing for his family and has a great retirement plan selling insurance but you know he sits there and goes ah i wish i would have done some of the things you did you know so (laughs) Yeah, because they're not passionate about <laughs> I'm like, their I job. wish I would. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. You know, so, you know, um, and a, and a friend of mine that I've known since high school, we had a conversation just last week too, and he, you know, he said he's like, hey, just keep doing what makes you happy. You know, don't, you know, you got to take care of yourself, but being happy is important too. So, you know, it's finding a finding a happy medium in there as well. You know, um, but yeah, finding a way to, you know, to make to make some money where that the, the need, the, it, sometimes it did feel like I struggled just cause you know, I was so available and maybe too dedicated to the radio stations I work for and too much to answer that phone call if it was there. But then again, I, I was the first guy that called and they knew they could depend on me for what they needed. So, uh, but I got through it and I'm here today still doing okay. So, you know, it didn't, it wasn't the worst thing. Would, would you say that this is something that you're passionate about, though? Is that why you really stayed the course? Because you, you love to do what you do. Unlike your friend that um, you said about, uh, I believe, in the insurance guy or, mm-hmm. or right? Oh, I absolutely. I think, um, you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed a lot of stuff on you know radio and television, but spent a lot of years listening to radio. My mom gave me a transistor radio when I was when I was very young and I'm uh, a bit older than my younger sister, she's six years younger than me. So, you know, I was, uh, and then when she was still a baby, that's when I was really listening to a lot of, you know, radio, AM, FM, a lot of baseball and stuff. So the radio became my friend. I would get home from school, do some homework, put on the radio. I would catch a baseball game or, you know, football or something. And then, you know, spin up and down the dial and find a, you know, find a song I like. And there was something about it 
that appealed to me and friends of mine, we started playing around with, with uh, tape recorders and, you know, trying to create our own little radio skits and stuff like that. And, you know, somewhere along the way, it definitely decided that it was, it was in my blood, either the entertainment aspect, the com comedic aspect, or, you know, just, you know, also being able to, to talk to people and interview people as a reporter, you know, you can go up and ask people questions and, and stuff like that and not, and not feel like they're going to turn you away. You know, you have an ability to, you know, to, and to provide a service for people that have a story to get out there. So, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of other ideas of things I wanted to do, you know, getting up in high school, law enforcement seemed like fun for a little bit. I dabbled in <laughs> some police science classes. And at some point, another epiphany goes, yeah, you know, someday someone might want to shoot back at you or, you know, I want to hit you back, you know, just being a lawman's not, you know, a perfect type thing. And I realized maybe something safer or uh, with less gunplay might be better for my future. And, um, yeah, about then I, you know, I think I saw. And now you play Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, but yeah, I think somewhere along the way I was at some party and there was like a DJ who was playing music and I just was interested in how everybody was, you know, just responding to the songs he was playing. And it was like virtually the same stuff that I heard on the radio or is in my record collection. And then I, you know, I, I started paying attention to the radio stations I listened to and then started calling some of the jocks, you know, and go, how'd you get your start? And a lot of them, you know, they told me to go to a couple of places and I, you know, took a lot of their advice. And then it was really cool years later when I, you know, got to work with them and go, hey, Jim Robinson, do you remember me? I called you when I was like 17 and you told me to go to this college and hey, here I am. I'm doing the shift right after you. So, you know, it was, uh, it was just kind of cool to, to kind of go through that. But I've always had fun. It's, it's in my blood. I even told people like when I was still in college and trying to get to a point where, it, where I could get paid and it could become a profession. I even told friends, I go, you know, if I never make it, I'll just find a regular job and I'll just work at this uh, volunteer community college station because this is a lot of fun. And uh, it's more fun to get paid for what you want, but you know, there's playlists and radio. There's certain program directors that will allow you to say things. They maybe will allow you to be a personality or don't want certain parts of your personality to, you know, to come through. So every now and then, even in a creative field, there can be a box or a wall that you have to have to deal with as well. So. So that's good. Uh, so, so Jay, do you, do you, um, what, what, what's your thoughts on the, the future of the radio industry? knowing that you know what's uh, a lot has changed with radio now we have podcasts you're on a podcast everyone's doing podcasts with the internet um they have clubhouse now the uh, the app that that we're on um mm -hmm. speaking a lot so we're like there's so many different forms of um uh, ways to express the vocal language where, where does that leave radio well i think it's becoming it's kind of growing more into a, a communication medium for voices and not so much, you know, back then it used to be a way to, you know, the music industry would, you know, give records to the radio stations and before the internet or certain other things or MTV even, you know, to flash back to the eighties one more time, you know, even other channels that would get music out there, you know, that's where people found music. Now you can go to a thing like any app, like a Spotify, a Pandora, Apple music, any of these type of things. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to a band's website, you can go to YouTube music. There's a bunch of different musical aggregators out there. And, you know, listening to say the big station in your town to hear new music isn't really going to happen anymore. So musically, there's a, there's kind of a big stagnation. Uh, record labels aren't really signing and promoting bands like they used to, you know, it's a lot more self-promotion. So, you know, podcasting in and a lot of talk and sports radio is, is really the future, the current and the future. You know, I think a lot of stuff like peer to peer podcasting or interviews is, is very fun where, you know, you can have an athlete and there's a lot of NBA players who, when they're done with their game, they'll go back to their hotel room and they'll interview a guy on their podcast from another, another team and talk about what it's like being in the NBA, or maybe they have a, you know, something, but it's like, if you're a, a fan of that industry, like on your situation, 
on the Finance Live podcast, people want to find out more about finance or want to find out about you or some of the other guests that you have, want to find out more about, you know, financial and economics, you know, this is a great way to hear a couple of people back and forth talking about finances, ec- economics. Um, like the drummer of Metallica, he does a great job interviewing other rock stars and talking about rock and roll stuff. And if you're a fan of rock and roll, you're like, yeah, I want to hear Lars's podcast. He's talking with another musician today. And oh, yeah, they have some stories. And, you know, so there's there's that to it where it can be entertainment or, you know, it, it still needs to be entertaining, but can be more educational and informative. And I think a lot of people that are stepping into, you know, uh, independent podcasting or broadcasting are are telling stories, have a lot to offer, have been professional people throughout their life and have a lot of experience and maybe more than some of the experts that we see, you know, on TV and stuff like Dr. Phil is a well-known person, but maybe there's a better psychiatrist for, or psychologist or whatever it is that he specializes, Mm -hmm. you know, for other people, but, you know, because he's on TV, he, he gets that, but there's a lot of people that can give just as good or maybe better for certain people advice. Um, you know, so I think people are really getting into it because they, they want to help or give back or, you know, reach out to, you know, tell more about their industry and what some of the benefits are and what, how they can really help people, you know, and I think, um, you know, getting out through, you know, podcasting and talking to other experts in the field is a great way to do it. And, you know, it also kind of does help promote business a little bit, you know, if you're a, a chiropractor talking about chiropractor stuff and you know someone happens to see it or does a search on youtube and you happen to come up for whatever it is that you do you know they'll they'll go to you first and maybe you know go to your website or contact you for you know goods and services or information from there so you know a lot of people i think are having fun with it but also it's a it's it is a good way to market and and get your name out there and let people know you know what what you do and, and your expertise in whatever field it is. So that's what I think is, is going to be the future. You know, it's a lot of peer to peer type of conversations Podcast, happening. Podcasting though, right? I think so. I mean, radio is always going to sort of be in cars, you know, but with Wi-Fi, you know, people can, can, can listen to podcasts in their cars now with smartphones. It's one wire. You're right into the system. You can listen to it through any of your favorite aggregators. You can download it you know, and stuff like that too. And then, and then audio books are another thing that's getting into cars too. So, um, you know, there's just a, a lot out there, but I'm seeing it being more, um, you know, creative content by people conversely, instead of, you know, the, the music, music stuff, music's got more to live performance. And then even the last year that got squashed with a pandemic, it started to open up again, but, you know, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, record sales have been down and bands have been making money by going out and touring, you know, and people are, you know, people are happy to go out and see a live show. And a lot of people that if, if you like a band, uh, a lot of times people like, well, I like the band's older stuff. I don't like their new stuff. So you go to a concert and, you know, again, it could be the Rolling Stones. And I saw them at a concert back in the eighties and they introduced one of their new songs and the crowd was kind of like, oh, I don't know. And then, you know, so mix like, oh, you don't want to hear the new stuff. Huh? So the band huddled up really quick and then played this new song, you know, which is now a classic. <laughs> and, you know, they, they played it really well with intensity, like, all right, we're going to deliver the song and then you guys decide, you know, what it is. But I think so many people really like hearing the nostalgic stuff now. And partly because they're, you know, they're not being spoon fed the new music. Now they have to maybe go out and find it. And once you get past a certain point, usually teenage, early 20s, you know, adults, we get set into our own ways with what we like, and we don't necessarily seek out a new music unless that's your industry. So what, just to, for the record, though, what, what do you think will happen to the actual radio industry? Do you think at some point that its competition will be too strong? It'll put them out of business like the newspaper in this, uh, businesses that have, have pretty much, you know, been disappearing the past 20 years? Oh, uh, that's certainly a possibility. You know, a lot of the smaller independent stations that are in the in the smaller cities across the country, you know, they used to be a place where, you know, like a guy like me could, you know, work my way up, save money, go buy a radio station, you know, retire in a city and, and run a radio station where uh, that opportunity has, has shrunk a lot. The technology to bring in automation and other stuff 
you know, is also taken away from, you know, developing more, more talent. But I do think those, you know, those channels will still be there. Those, uh, those towers, those, those signals that have been, you know, granted by the FCC. So there will still be broadcasting, but it'll, it'll probably change. And it might eventually bring in more people that are, you know, that are big name and, and podcasters and go more to that where, you know, uh, you know, you mentioned a name like Howard Stern. He was a traditional AM FM morning jock. He was, you know, out of the East Coast, big thing in New York. Then he went to, you know, as you know, Philadelphia, Washington, and then, you know, nationwide. And after that was successful, a number of other jocks followed kind of the same. A lot of other companies did that too. They figured we can get, you know, a really good talent. and It'll be cheaper to sort of, uh, you know, broadcast their show on all these stations. So I, I kind of think podcasting, some of the bigger, more successful, well-followed podcasts might end up getting an opportunity to be on these uh, signals, the FCC, AM and FM stuff. That might be something that'll be happening soon. At some point, there's going to be a lot more podcasters than new music writers. Mm-hmm. You know? and they, and, they need uh, money to survive the, these radio stations, right? Oh, they absolutely do. And that's the advertising advertising model. And the advertising model is based on listeners or viewers or readers, you know, how many people check out your show, your, you know, your, um, your presentation. So, you know, the more listeners you have, the more you can, you know, charge, you know, charge for that, you know, but also AM FM radio is different where there's a lot of situations, especially with something like the analytics tools, you know, where you can look at your analytics on your website and go, oh, I got a listener from British Columbia. I got somebody from Miami, Florida. I got, you know, then I'll even break down to what, uh, you know, what type of phone or what type of computer, what type of um, operating system, you know, is coming in. So we know the analytics are there and can really slice the pie very specific where AM, FM radio, they would send out these books or these diaries randomly to people and people would fill them out. And then the industry, basically their ratings were reflective of people filling out these, these books. And, you know, one, you know, there's a lot of tricks to the trade, you know, they, that's what they would do contests and early in the morning because people, you know, Hey, we got to turn paper due. We're going to turn it in at the last minute. None of us start day one of the semester and start doing a paragraph a day on our term paper, we wait till Saturday night before it's due and probably, you know, stay up all weekend or, you know, we're all kind of deadline people. So people that handed in the uh, Arbitron diaries, you know, oftentimes they would fill it out. Oh yeah. I listen to that station. I listen to them all the time, you know, or, you know, whatever it is they would maybe. So essentially they weren't so accurate. So a lot of the advertising from that, you know, was a lot of old sales, smoke and mirrors, buying from someone, you know, um, selling demographic basically. And, you know, a lot of that is now taken over where some of the old advertising model is now not good enough for some of the people who want to spend a marketing dollar. They throw out this buzzword ROI mm-hmm. and, uh, people are like, well, I don't see a return on the radio thing. Or, you know, I got a little bit better with my print because they bring in this coupon or something. And I, anyway, business people, they have to see where their ROI is coming from. And if radio was, chain hadn't changed with the other things like analytics then the people who are newer to business aren't going to go with the older models so something will have to change and radio is the one that's going to have to make the change and just for, for the audiences the the audience that is um, new to finance roi stands for return on investment so that's how much money you want to make on your investment so for example if you're looking to earn 10 percent, right or 15 percent, that would be your roi and of course, you want to always get an ROI or return on investment that's higher than your costs because you want to make more money than you're spending. So when you don't make more money than you're spending, what happens, Jay? Well, that advertiser doesn't <laughs> renew. That salesperson has to go to their sales manager and tell them a sad story. And the sales manager goes, it's unacceptable. We need to get sales, go to someone else or, you know figure it out but they lose the account if uh, the person if the if the campaign doesn't work you know and then sometimes there's reasons why advertising campaign might work maybe your product is maybe the market's oversaturated maybe your product isn't that good maybe uh you know maybe it's too early or maybe the boat is already maybe the ship has already sailed and people aren't buying uh 
Pokemon cards anymore, or maybe <laughs> they're not buying Pokemon cards yet or something, whatever it is. So timing, um, a lot of stuff could factor into that too. It's not just, as, you know, but people will always go, well, no one listens to your station or something, you know, mm -hmm. and that could be true. They might've not heard your ad, you know, so people typically do turn out, turn out of commercials, but, you know, I find myself, if I'm watching something, changing the channel or listening to something and changing the channel to skip an ad, I'm going to miss what the host just said to stay around for, or I'm going to have to, you know, now I'm going to miss the part of the plot in the TV show <laughs> that kind of links it all together. I, now I don't know why they're after this guy, you know? So, um, I mean, I think people are patient enough to sit through a certain amount of ads if they like the program and are getting a value or entertainment out of it, you know, whatever it is for them. Thank you, Jay. So um, next question, we're going to spend a little bit. Um, so my, my first book really set the theme for a lot of my, my books. I, I wrote uh, The Necessity of Finance um, to highlight the importance of finance and um, it, that it's necessary for everyone, everyone to learn no matter what. So Jay, now you come at it from a different angle from the radio industry. Um, would you say that that, that uh, statement holds true for yourself and your business that you that you've entered uh that uh for businesses in their in the radio industry would you say that that they need to also understand the basic lessons of finance as well absolutely you know a radio station needs to figure out i mean there or there's you know there's costs for a lot of things uh, one of the biggest costs was uh talent you got to pay you know Howard Stern's good. He brings a lot of listeners. Got to pay Howard Stern. And Howard Stern's or any talent smart enough to go, oh, if you're making X amount of dollars off me, I deserve at least 0.25 of X or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, if you're making millions off me, I deserve a cut too. So um, there's a lot of other expenses, but there's, uh, you know, many ways that, you know, there's, but there's also investments in the business too. So it's a matter of being, you know, being smart and maybe, you uh, you know, paying for the things you absolutely have to have. And, you know, there's some ways to, to, to develop, you know, talent too. You know, maybe if, you know, a company maybe doesn't think they can afford, you know, top line talent, but maybe they can hire a coach to, to find people for them and stuff. So uh, definitely ways, ways to do that. But, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people that, that, you know, spend foolishly on things they don't need, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, radio stations, a lot of times it could be an office space, you know, you really don't need much else for a studio other than a microphone and some processing and, and recording equipment where, you know, some stations might think, oh, we need to have big fancy office space. And maybe they're spending way too much for, you know, if they cut down on a, you know, an expense like that, they could actually put more money back into their air talents or the infrastructure of the station they have to pay. And then part of the thing in radio too, they have to pay the licensing to the music that they're playing. You know, again, uh, these musicians and the labels, they, you know, they write the music, the labels hand them out to promote it, but like, um, they also deserve to get paid for the airplay, you know? So they get paid royalties and stations have to, you know, pay for that a little bit. It's kind of unfair for a station or radio in general, an industry to sit there and take money from an artist or, to make money off an artist who's creating something trying to, you know, of course they want to sell records and concert tickets or what have you, you know, so for as a radio station to make a lot of money and not pay the artist for providing essentially what makes the radio station, the radio station, you know, if you're a classic rock channel and all these musicians have made all this great music for all these years and you're making money off it, they certainly deserve, you know, to be, to be paid and compensated. So um, that's another one of the biggest expenses in, in music radio is the licensing for the music. Uh, they have to pay the royalty fees. And that goes to the publishing companies who divvy that out somehow. Uh, so, you know, definitely finance and all ends of, of radio and, and all other media, very important, just like any other business and any other venture in life. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. So, Thank you. um, we only have a, a few few more minutes left here, Jay. I know you got to get going. So, um, in the in the radio industry, do you considering the difficulties of becoming successful like yourself? Uh, what, is there any tips that you can offer to uh, new 
new entrepreneurs or um, people who are younger that or just getting into the business that want to become a major radio producer uh, like yourself? Uh, yeah, I would offer a, a couple of things. Number one, if you're, if you want to, you know, kind of decide what avenue you want to do the best. If you want to be a personality on air, you know, work on that, you know, work on your, your diction, work on your vocabulary, work on your, your voice presentation and, and those things. If you want to be a producer, you know, work on meeting people, work on talking to people, connecting with people and making sure you stay in contact with them. It's not, it's no good to get a bunch of business cards or a bunch of emails and not follow up or, or just follow up to, to push your, your business. So you want to, you got to build relationships. And back in the day, they would, they would look for producers and in the ad, they would say, basically we're paying for your Rolodex. We want your contacts so you can help our station or our morning show grow. So, um, you know, stay in contact and keep in contact with those people, build that uh, Rolodex or that contact base email list nowadays is the new Rolodex. <laughs> um, you know, if you're a personality, you know, you know, work on, work on that, always work on, you know, um, being better at, at presenting yourself, increasing your, your ability to speak you know, vocabulary wise. And, and the other thing too, is, you know, you want to be kind of want to be confident in what you are and who you are and what you're going to present, you know, like in your case, Tony, you're, finance professor you have an amazing finance background you probably even if you like to say work on cars you probably are going to be better at what you're an expert at in finance so you know you're be confident in that and and you know stay with uh stay with our strengths you know a lot of people again try to be able to do too much because maybe they they see somebody who is able to to branch out into a lot of areas so you know be confident in, in your strengths and definitely, you know, amplify those and, and try to, you know, stay with that. And the other last thing somebody told me too, I was making tapes and trying to get auditions and saying, and I asked a friend of mine, I go, well, I don't know what it is they want. And he goes, stop right there. <laughs> you, you can't worry about what they want. All you can do is give them what you got. So you got to be yourself. And if somewhere along the way, yeah, you might need to make adjustments of what that is, but you still have to be yourself. You have to be true to yourself. Now, if you're not going to be, you know, if your personality isn't the game show host, then, you know, try not to be the new Jeopardy host probably isn't going to work for you. But, you know, if you like doing interviews and talking to people and are inquisitive, then, you know, be a good interviewer, ask good questions, uh, find out that, you know, so definitely you know, find what it is you like and, and really try to amplify that the best you can. Wow. That words of wisdom. Very <laughs> good. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate well, it. I hope, I hopefully I learned something along the way here. <laughs> As we all good. should, you know. So um, let's see, how, how has the, uh, how's the pandemic changed your life? And what, what advice would you give to anyone who's struggling right now in the great pandemic depression? Well, one minute um, again. Yeah. Um, as far as how it changed my life, you know, my hobby as far as playing music has been put on the back burner. There has not been a lot of live shows or ability to see live shows. It's starting to kind of come back a little bit. So uh, for me, I'd spend a lot of time working, but I also spend a lot of time besides, you know, working like on audiobooks. I've also spent time working on myself, trying to find out things in my personality that maybe I wanted to change or things in my personality that I, that I'm grateful for. I go, Hey, this is a strength of mine. I like this about me, or this is something that, Hey, maybe this is a great opportunity to, to put this part away and, and, and lessen this part of me. So, and I will also communicate with your friends, your family, or anybody that you can. I think we're all really isolated. And at times we might feel like being alone, but at other times hearing a voice talking about anything and just checking in with each other right now, being open to communication with anybody is a, is a good thing to help us all get through it because we all, we all need, we all need each other. You know, we're, we're pack animals really, <laughs> you know, even if we're introverted, I, I'm a slight introverted, but I like to mix it up with people. I like, I miss hanging out with people. I miss seeing friends. I miss meeting new people and just finding out new things about people, you know, a day at the park. And the next thing you know, you run into somebody who's 
you know, from somewhere else. And Oh, Hey, I have a friend from Philadelphia too, you know, <laughs> and just sometimes magic happens that way. And then they go, Oh, Hey, and then they know that guy. And then next thing you're friends, you know? Excellent. Thank you, Jay. Um, you're welcome. One other question in regards to what you do, you take it for granted because you, you get up and do it every day, but you speak in front of about a thousand people on average, uh, an hour, I think you said. Mm -hmm. That is uh, very intimidating for many people. The average person, uh, most people are afraid to do public speaking. Actually, statistics prove that they're probably more afraid than, of that than other major things like death. Um, I don't know about the, the actual details of those statistics, but it sounds about right. So how are, is someone like yourself able to overcome that fear and just do it like um, without even hesitation on a daily basis. Well, it at some point I realized, you know, I was kind of a shy, introverted kid, but there was a girl who was in a class of mine, <laughs> you know, uh, when we we're trying to decide what we're doing. It might have been the career decision making class. And she turns around, she goes, You and radio, you hardly even talk to me during class. How are you <laughs> going to talk to a bunch of people? So, I realized I didn't need to overcome that. And uh, the next semester, I took a speech class, you know, same English teacher at my school and, you know, started stuff like that. But I would take any opportunity to get up in front of a small group or some of my larger groups. You know, back in school, I was always the first guy to, you know, the teacher would ask a question. I would always kind of blurt out the first answer, figuring if someone gets the ball rolling, other people will jump in and then I wouldn't have to be way around to be called on you know so mm -hmm. and and half the time i would be right and you know you could just move on but i would i would have people you know talk to as many people as they can if you're involved in a you know church or a worship you know center you know talk to people there see if you can get involved i mean almost every place like that has uh, music programs maybe some uh, drama or you know stuff to you know promote what they do so basically would, practice right yeah, you know, get out there as much as you can. If you're working at a store, talk to your customers. If you're shopping at a store, talk to the to the people who are working there. Ask them questions, you know. And then, you know, when you do talk, you definitely need to be present with, uh, you know, people. Don't just wait around to speak. You know, you want to hear what the other person is saying and then clue in on that. And then you just kind of got to go for it and have some success or maybe some failure. I definitely had some failures that made me go back to the drawing board and become a better public speaker. So, you know, sometimes we got to stub our toe to get there and, you know, and it helps you learn and you grow. Thank you, Jay. Two quick questions and then we'll be able to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, so first, and if you could answer them in less than one minute, uh, where, what would you like to accomplish in the next five to 10 years? And then the second question will be, what would you like to be as your legacy? So let's start with the first one. Oh, uh, where would I like to be in the next five to 10 years? I would like to be one of the biggest, most successful known names in the audio book narrating industry. I'd like to be somebody who's on a, on a top short list of go-to people. And, you know, with that will, you know, maybe come other opportunities to become more financially successful and comfortable where I take care of myself and maybe give back to more people too. And, and maybe help mentor people who want to get into maybe audiobooks or, or radio and, and some of the stuff I've had kind of success with. So that's kind of where I see myself going in 10 years. I think broadcasting and radio is a, is a long term thing. So I'd like to, you know, see my legacy as someone who's been on the mic for, you know, at 85. I'd like to say I've been doing it for 75 years when I get there. <laughs> when I'm 90, say it's been uh, 75 years. I like I like the old baseball announcers. Like Ben Skelly is one of my heroes. Even though uh, Dodgers are my favorite team, he's my favorite broadcaster. And he was able to broadcast into like his late 80s. He's still around. I think he just finally was like, I just need to enjoy life. But, you know, he had done a good 50 years of broadcasting. So, you know, to have a, to have a legacy to be a, a good broadcaster and podcaster and, and mentor to others would be great. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. And uh, before we close out, any last thoughts or comments or where, where do we find you at Jay? Um, well, the new fans. Yeah. The, well, the newest thing I really, really enjoy is clubhouse, which thanks to you, I'm, I'm now on there and, you know, people can uh, definitely follow Dr. Finance or, or me, Jay Cruz media 
on Clubhouse. It's a it's kind of a newer medium right now, only available on Apple, but it's it's a lot of fun because conversations are happening and it's not just pictures and texts and words. Um, you know, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, basically under J Cruz Media is how you can find me. And um, you can email me, jcruzmedia at yahoo.com. And very soon, probably this summer, there will be a new website under that name, J Cruz Media. So you can essentially find me under that J Cruz Media title. And there is a website that should be hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll launch after your, your next book is available too. That your book is a priority before my website. So yeah, we're, we're about two, two more months out and we'll have uh, all three audio books, folks, for all three books. The, the, uh, the Necessity of Finance, The Most Important Lessons in Economics and Finance. And he's working on a 500 plus page book, my last one, The Survival of the Riches. That's why it's taking so long. There's a lot of pages here. So, uh, you know, we want to do a great job. And Jay does very good. He uh, takes his time with everything. So. All right, Jay, if you don't mind, I'd like to wrap it up because I know you got a meeting soon. I do. This has been a lot of fun. It's so, so enjoyable. to. It's always great to spend time with you and talk with you. I know we chat from time to time, just staying up on what's going on and different projects that uh, we're both involved with. But it's always, a, it's always a great opportunity. And I like, you know, sharing these conversations publicly, too. That's uh, what the, like I said, it's one of the fun things about this job is that I get to talk to a lot of people and these conversations get shared publicly. So, you know, that's, that's great too. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jay, again, for coming to our podcast and um, I'm going to close out now. So thank you all for watching the uh, watching and listening to the Dr. Finance live podcast. My name is Dr. Anthony Crenitti the fourth. I go by Dr. Finance and my website is on that window right there, drfinance.info. For more information, please feel free to visit, uh, subscribe, and follow. And we'll see you on the next episode. So thanks again, everyone. And thank you, Jay, for coming again. Bye-bye now. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me. Okay. You you're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.